Romans 5, verse 5. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sin sows the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, and where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I, I love those descriptions that you hear sometimes about the optimist and the pessimist. And I came across one the other day which I thought was very good. Someone has described an optimist as a person who goes into a restaurant with no money and believes that he can pay for his meal with the pearl that he hopes to find in the oyster he plans to order. That is an optimist. But the Christian is an unquenchable optimist. And he has great grounds for joying and rejoicing. No question that last week we saw that the Christian should rejoice in his tribulations or her tribulations. We had that in the passage last week. But notice that after that, we break into our passage at verse 5. Just follow me down the passage. We glory, verse 3, in tribulation, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And when you're going through it, and you're really under pressure, the end result, the fruit of it all, is Christian hope. And Christian hope is something which you should never be ashamed of. You 
You need never under any circumstance be ashamed of Christian hope that is in your heart, believer. Earthly hopes can be very disappointing, can't they? I mean, you just watch victorious Coventry and dejected Tottenham Hotspur. When they get their medals, one just beside themselves with joy, the other, you'd think, the world had just stopped because a bag of wind didn't go through two posts <laughs> often enough for them. And as they go mad and they sing and they hug each other and they jump and grown men without hair just like me, old men like me, run around in dark suits in front of thousands and jump and hold cups and kiss and hug each other. And I said to my daughter, I said, and all over a bag of wind. Well, I don't know whether she appreciated that or not, but she laughed. And when you think about it, they take it so seriously. It's incredible. You'd think the world had stopped. And you hear commentators, how good this will be for the Midlands of England, such a depressed area. A bag of wind has gone through two posts three times. Heart will lift the morale of central England. It will be sky blue forever, almost, because a bag of wind went between two posts skillfully even though it came off the opposition <laughs> to win. Incredible. Or even will we ever forget that scene that came from the Olympics whenever there was that collision between um, that little South African runner, Zola Budd, and Mary Decker, and Mary Decker is virtually hauled off that Olympic track I was going to say, maybe it's not fair, but it looked to me as if she was kicking and screaming with disappointment. You think of what that girl went through to train to get there, one of the greatest athletes in the world in her field, and then she's tripped or whatever, or falls. And oh, the, the utter disappointment of that girl, a seeming life work, you know, cut down by one single fall. Uh, shall we ever forget those images a few years ago when Jimmy Carter sat there almost biting his lip as those men held back those hostages just until the new U.S. president was sworn in so that he would not have the joy of seeing them brought home in his presidency and his enemies held them back. Um, I must say, you know, Jimmy has a lot of critics, but I, I must say... I'll never forget how gracefully he did it. It must have been very difficult. You know, Dryden, um, a poet, once said, when I consider life, tis all a cheat. Yet fooled with hope, men favor the deceit. Trust on and think tomorrow will repay Tomorrow's falser than the former day. Lies worst, and while it says we shall be blessed, with some new joys, cuts off what we possessed. And Dryden is saying, there is no hope. It's all a cheat. Or as Napoleon said on one occasion, life is such a bore. It's such a cross. See, the point of our text is that the hope that comes, yes, hope, verse 5, notice it, maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The point of the text is that the hope that comes from the love of God which keeps on pouring into our hearts with a, by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, Christian. And he sees to it that the love of God keeps pouring into you day after day, year after year, right through your life, pouring, 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 like the fella who put a wee sign up under the Niagara Falls and it said, there's more. 
I sometimes wonder where our friend in Ireland got his little um, shut the door, there's more. I wonder, was he at the Niagara Falls? But the guy who was under there, he had the little catchphrase away. And those days, as he watched it come pouring over, he knew that for years there would be more and more and more where it came from. And so it is, when you're a believer, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given to you. And the whole purpose, of course, is that you might have hope. Hope. It's fantastic, isn't it? And that hope that you ought not to be ashamed of is different to all other kinds of earthly hopes. You see, I, I often think sometimes people going past here on a summer's night like this, they must wonder what you're all doing in here. You know, what on earth would they see in it? They have a look at the preacher probably through those glass doors and flee. But the plain fact is that you know, many of you, as you feed on the Word of God, that the preacher is just a vehicle for preaching the truth of God that many of you have experienced in your lives and know to be true. Did you have something tonight that no earthly hope could ever give you? See, you look around you. You look around you. When you were a little kid, you know, little child, I was up in Ballymena preaching one day and a lady gave me a real dressing down. They do sometimes, boy, she gave it to me for daring to call children kids. She says to me, goats have kids, you know, hey. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Not quite. And I've heard a whole lot of preachers here, and you see you here, hey, you know, goats have kids. So I was given off to for calling children kids. Oh, well, the Lord bless you, dear, wherever you are. But kids, when they begin to grow, they begin to, to want things. I want, I want, I want, I want. I remember asking my psychology professor at university once, Amazing man, used to chew his false teeth as he lectured. And I remember him, and I said to him, could you define the soul? And he said, the soul? He said, well, he said, when a little child says, I, that is the soul functioning. I want, I think, whatever. Which I thought was an interesting, interesting definition. Little children want things. They want things. And they soon begin to learn in life they don't get everything they want. And of course, when they do get some of the things they do want, they discover that it isn't as great a joy as they thought it would be. You know, kids look forward to things for, for, for months maybe, and then when they have that holiday or get to that place, it's a disappointment to them. You see, you know and I know that earthly hope is linked with fear. There's not an earthly hope that human beings have that isn't coupled with fear. Let me prove it to you. You hope to get high marks in your exams? Well, I sure hope you get them. This is a very tough time for some of you. You hope to get high marks in your exams? But you know, as I know when I was doing mine, there is that nagging fear, no matter how hard you work, that you won't get high marks. So you have hopes, but you have fears. You hope to make the hockey team, teenager, do you? You hope to make it, but then you fear you won't. Maybe there's a young filly here, and you hope to get a job, and you got the job all right, but somebody else got the girl that you wanted to marry. And you're disappointed and you're sitting here tonight sick at heart. Maybe there's some girl here and someone has proposed to her and you have chosen to marry this person, but you know that you must take them for worse or for better. And as you look around you, and every week I get notes to this place to pray for marriages that are breaking down all over the place. And you know even as you enter into to marriage that in fact it could be a disappointment because many of your friends, their marriages are on the rocks or ending in tragedy. Okay, you want to marry them, but one in three marriages crack up, break up. So that although you're filled with hope, it's coupled with fear. Everybody has that. 
Many a girl can see tonight what drink or lust can do in a fella's life. So there's fear in her heart. And every parent knows this. I know it. You look down upon your little first child as it is born and your heart is filled with hope for that child. What a joy it is to have that child or those children. But the very hope that you have for your children is linked with fear. Will the child live? Will they stay strong in body? Will their little minds be bright? Will they get into trouble? Will they bring heartache? The child lying there in the cot is a little white bundle of hopes and fears. Hope and fear are inseparable in business. Not a businessman here tonight, but you haven't got fears that your business will collapse. Many of you in a social world, you, you, you maybe are rising in a social world, but although you may be rising and moving in circles you never moved in before, there is the fear in your heart that in social, personal, or business life that it could all collapse in five minutes and far less. Every aspect of human life is a combination of hope and fear. And that's true for the non-Christian. But I want to tell you it's also true for the Christian. In those areas of a Christian's life that aren't centered in God, there may be areas of your life and my life tonight that aren't centered in the Lord. They're centered in other things. And on the practical level, you and I need fuller assurance in our Christian lives. So what does God do? God, every day of our lives, wants to wean us, wean us away from confidence in the things of earth to having confidence in invisible things that we can't see with these physical eyes. Invisible things that will never deceive you and that will never disappoint you. And that's where the battle line is, 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 is drawn. If you live for the tangible only and the material only, you'll be disappointed. Even as a Christian, if you center your life in the material and the tangible alone, and you sow to the flesh rather than sow to the Spirit, you'll be disappointed. But Christian, if you center your life in the Lord and all areas of your life in the Lord, that's why I put that little quote at the bottom <clears throat> of your notes. Whatever you do, begin with God, said Matthew Henry. Whatever you do, begin with God. So that this hope that the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, brings us will never deceive or disappoint and he'll wean you it's not that you can't have you, you know you give up dealing with material things or, or tangible things you have to deal with these things but we're talking about where your confidence lies I hope you don't have you know if you have great hopes for people and you put people on a pedestal you'd be disappointed no matter who the person is there'll be a disappointment there never was a hero yet that wasn't a disappointment. The Christian's hope, you see, is different. And his confidence in, is different. It's not in people. It's not in material things. It's not in earthly power. Christian's hope has not the slightest mixture of fear in it. True Christian hope. Why? Because it rests on the nature and character of God. And God will never deceive anyone who trusts in him. You ever find God deceived you yet? And it's because your God is eternal. He will never die. See, you could have confidence in a person, and then they would die, and you would lose their comfort and their kind words. But here is a God that we joy in tonight who will never die. So that gives you confidence. Once you trust in him, you're trusting in one who will go on forever. Our trust in him will never be confounded. You'll not be sorry. And the eternal God, Christian, is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms.
That's where your hope lies. Because your hope rests in an eternal God and also on an unchangeable God. He's not going to change. Which hope we have, says the Bible, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now, let's look at this text, verse 5, as being like a tree. Okay? It's a difficult text to understand. I've wrestled with it. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Look on it as being like a tree. The fruit of the tree is your hope. The tree itself, look upon that as the love of God shed abroad in your heart. That's the tree itself. And the root of the tree is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that is the root that gives the sustenance to the tree where the love of God is shed abroad in your life. And the fruit of it is you've got hope. And you've got to remember that people out there who are lost don't have the love of God in their hearts. They don't have the love of God to react to things whenever they happen. They don't have that root of the Holy Spirit and the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. And notice that it is the Holy Spirit which is given to us. Now, let's take a wee moment, you know, with that word Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit. A lot of people have problems with that word Holy Ghost as it is in the authorized version and still fairly um, frequently used in creeds and so on and in public prayers. What does it mean, the Holy Ghost? Well, you see, here you have a problem with the history of words. When William the Conqueror came with his Normans, French-speaking Normans, they brought their language into Anglo-Saxon England. And little by little, the two languages, the French language and the Anglo-Saxon language, amalgamated to form our mother tongue. But in the process, a child would begin born to parents, you see, would begin to adopt thousands of words from both parents, say a Norman would marry an Anglo-Saxon or whatever, and then the child would pick up phrases from both, and that brought them into the new language that sometimes used a French word and an English word interchangeably, and ghost is one of them. I am told that the word ghost, of course, in French, revenant, means a returning one. And of course, in English, the word ghost means the spirit of a person after they're dead. And then links up with this idea that people have that the spirit of a person comes to haunt a place. So that today, if you're going to use that word ghost, then you're going to have difficulty with it because the language has changed and the vast majority of people look upon a ghost as the spirit of a person coming back to haunt somewhere. I think that, um, in fact, it is an advantage to refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit because of that problem in the language with the word ghost. So that I think it's more accurate to say the Holy Spirit give the exact meaning to who he is. But there is one of the problems that you have in translation it is very difficult to resolve. But I think that you will be on very firm ground if you call him the Holy Spirit. And nobody will get any connotations of other things. What does the word spirit mean? Holy Spirit. If originally in French it meant returning one, send the comforter, of course, and he'll, he'll, he'll come and he'll comfort you, Jesus said, etc., what does the word spirit mean? Well, in Greek it means breath. It means pneuma. 
as we have it, when, when tires were first invented, they were called pneumatic tires because there was air in them. You still have today a pneumatic drill, which is compressed air. A pneumatic drill is because there's air in the drill, and it's driven by air in, in one sense. So pneuma, that word pneuma, meaning breath, is used scores of times in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit. Breath. The breath of God. The Spirit of God. And of course, we're told that on the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit came as a rushing mighty wind. Yes? In Isaiah, we read about man as being a nose full of breath. That's all he is, a nose full of breath. But here's a very interesting thought that, the, that Barnhouse points out. He says, you know how we breathe? And you breathe out, you exhale, and then you inhale. He says that never do we discover in, in Scripture, this is interesting, think about it, that God has to inhale. You never read of God in healing. In fact, the idea is given that God is forever breathing out. On and on and on and on and on. That's the idea of the power of the God that we have. That he doesn't have to inhale. There is so much there that it just goes on. The power is always there. It doesn't have to stop and get more in. It's always going. What a, what a reservoir of power. The Spirit of God. The breath of God. And, of course, we uh, know that He has given us of Himself. So that when you become a Christian and you are given, according to this verse, the Holy Spirit, then you have a power within you that you never had before for service. And the Spirit will give you power to serve. Now, understand, don't misunderstand me, the Spirit of God is not a power from God. The Bible teaches the Spirit of God is God. Is God. Not just uh, an idea of a power from God. He is God. And this idea of, of not having to inhale, but exhaling power. And that Holy Spirit is within you, Christian. And what a mighty verse that is then. Hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And it'll never stop. And notice that he is given to us. The Holy Spirit is given to every believer. That's very important. Just to show the, you the irrefutable proof of that, turn to chapter 8 and verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Romans 8 and 9. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, if any man have not, capital S, the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a believer. It's quite clear from Romans 8 and 9, irrefutably clear, that in fact, the Holy Spirit is given to every believer. Now back again to Romans 5. The Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's amazing truth. And that very God the Holy Spirit, that endless power is within us. Now notice that it is the word following it, verse 6, for. Yes, you've got the love of God shed abroad in your heart. That Holy Spirit is given to you and he sees to it, he's the root. And at the top of it, of the tree, out comes the fruit. You've got a hope. For Well, that explains the fact that the flowing warmth of life has its source in an act that was done far away. 
We have a strong hope that can never deceive us because of the inward flowing of the love of God from the outward historical fact of what? Well, it is the act of the death of Christ that allows God, the Holy Spirit, to come into us when we believe in Christ and that love of God to enter hearts that don't have it. Amazing, isn't it? Notice it's all based on the death of Christ. For, we have all this, for, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Isn't that beautiful? So that it is an act far away from us that originally brings us this power in our lives. This God, the Holy Spirit, this exhaling Spirit, this endless power that is God. Beautiful. When we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. Now, why did he do that? Because he loved us. Hmm. Well, why did he love us? Well, there's no answer to that question. If you seek to look beyond God, my friend, you're fool. You can't look beyond God. You're foolish. For beyond God, there is nothing. So don't go beyond God. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind stops at God. Stop there. Don't stop with a problem. Stop with God. Because there's nothing beyond that. That's the ultimate. You say, my, what a God. He loved us. When we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. Why? Because he loved us. Why did he love us? I can't explain it. See, you can't explain the sun by a candle. You can't hold a candle up to a child and say, I want to explain the sun to you. You can't explain the ocean by a drop of seawater. You can't explain a forest by a single leaf. You can't explain sorrow by a single tear. And you can't explain these visible things, these human emotions, on terms of little single things like a leaf or, a, or, or whatever. Can't be explained. Things that you can see can't be explained on that. And even human mo emotions can't be explained on it. Well, if you can't explain things that are visible, how are you going to explain things that are invisible and emotions that are divine emotions? How do you describe divine emotions, huh? So how can you explain to an audience like this the source of the love of God? For the love of God is God. For God is love. How can you explain it? Well, I can't explain it. I can only show you how it's been revealed. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for us. And from verse 6 to verse 11, God's love is commended. And the word commended is... Some of you will have it in, in another translation. Perhaps the word demonstrated. Well, the idea in the original is like if you were taking something to an exhibit and you were exhibiting it to others. And here is the love of God exhibited, shown out, shown forth, revealed so that everybody can see it. Can't explain it, but it's revealed. Oh, beautiful. Since there is cleansing, cleansing for me because Christ died and my hope is anchored in him, nothing can turn me from confidence toward God. Nothing. And that's what gives me my hope. See the hope demonstrated at Calvary. That hope that I have. Why is it so powerful? I'll tell you why it's powerful. Because when my sins rise up before me, I have only one answer. Christ died. And there is my hope. When I discover sin within me, I remember that he knew all about that flaw before the world was even formed. 
Nothing in my life that has happened astonishes him. He didn't attempt to reform me. He planned to give his son to die for me so that I might have new life. So that Calvary is the great exhibit of God's love, the demonstration of God's love. God's love revealed. Christ died for me, you see, according to plan. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It was according to plan. And what love it was. See, human love always has a selfish motive doesn't it? Very little of human life is without a selfish motive. Somebody does something, you say, wow, that's terrific, and then you discover they were using you. Maybe you've even found that. You take your girlfriend, a lovely, a lovely uh, box of, um, I always say black magic, but I shouldn't because it's not scriptural, but um, you take her some chocolate and you give it to her and she looks at you and say, what do you want? Or you go to your boss and you, you compliment him and say, you know, it's really, that's a good plan you've made, it's terrific. Is it a rise you're after? Yeah? We're all suspicious of each other, aren't we? See, human sacrifice is amazing, but sometimes it can be nothing but reckless bravado. Sometimes it can be nothing but a calculated risk. Sometimes it's even emotional unbalance. But then the highest category is the category that Christ said, greater love hath no man than this, but that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And this is a very interesting passage. I want you to really get it. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here is the great demonstration of it. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Here's the proof of it. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth, exhibits his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now you say, what does that mean? Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. You say, but Derek, earlier in the passage it says there is none righteous, there is none that doeth good. So why then do you have these words that somebody would die for a righteous man, maybe, and maybe even hardly for a righteous, but maybe for a good? What does that mean? Well, the two words righteous and good are used in an accommodated sense. It's an accommodation of the words. It's not a contradiction. Let me put it to you this way. There are some people who rigidly try to lead good lives. You know, they pay taxes, they don't do their neighbor any harm, they don't swear, they don't watch video nasties, they, they um, you know, or whatever. They're nice people in the sense that they lead outwardly lives that are rigidly just as far as the world's concerned. But you know that person who is, you know, if he's home from work and it's a government stamp, he works for the civil service and he's got a government, um, government rubber home, you know, uh, and the, the, this is government property and he won't rub out his little child's homework because he's wasting the government's money. I mean, I've known people to carry it that far. Or you say, well, they're being exact. Well, there are some people who would say, mm, that's going too far, you know. Mrs. Thatcher won't miss a little bit of rubber. What was that laugh for? <laughs> a little bit of rubber, you know. Or whatever. It's interesting, isn't it? You know how some people are righteous, but they are rigidly righteous. There is the policeman. You ask any policeman, and he catches some kid some night without lights on his bike or whatever, and it's the first time if he applies the law or if he lets the child go. Well, here's the problem, you see. People who are upright, rigidly just, but a trifle hard. Now, for that kind of person, says Paul, most people are not likely to lay down their lives. They might, but they're not likely to. 
But do you see a person who's not just a righteous person, but they are a good person? Yeah? A good man. That austere, rigid sticking to the law has been softened and made attractive because they're gracious and they are kind. We have a word for Ulster in it. Ach, they'd give you the butter out of their mouths. Or the sweet out of it. Not that you'd want it, but we have a phrase for it. If you English folk, you'll just have to forgive us. But you know what I mean, or wherever you're from. We have a little phrase like that. He's so kind, he'd give you the sweet out of his mouth. You know, somebody who's kind. Well, if a person like that were drowning or a person like that were in trouble, there are some woods. Well, says Paul, yes, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. You know, somebody that's got a grip on your affection, you say, oh, they're awful decent people, they've been kind to me or whatever. We're talking on a human level now. The human understanding of righteous and good. Not God's standard of righteousness and good. Well, it's within the limits of possibility that somebody might be found even to die for a person like that. Good person. For a righteous man, scarcely. But now, says Paul, God exhibits his love to us, and the proof of his love is that Christ died for us. And when did he die for us? He died for us while we were yet sinners. Neither righteous nor good even. We were against him. I often describe it in the way C.S. Lewis described it. He says, think of, of love as this. You know, people, people love teddy bears. I heard of a teddy bear that went recently for, what, 6,000 quid? I'm kind of going into the attic to look for mine, but it's gone at Sotheby's. You know the way even older men and women, they have an affection for an old teddy bear. You could have an affection for an old slipper. You could have an affection for an old coat. And your wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend might say, oh, for goodness sake, would you give that thing up? It's moth-eaten, it's finished. It went out with the Beatles, you know. E-A-T-L-E-S. Yes, it went out in the 60s. And you say, no, but it hugs me. I love it. It's, it's comfortable. You have an affection for the coat. You have an affection for the slipper. An affection for even a, a toy in childhood. Then, of course, there is that kind of love, which is um, friendship. And you get folks, you'll probably, after this meeting's over, you'll head off here, there, or yonder, and you'll take your friends with you, and they're kind of folk, you look out the same way in life with them. You're shoulder to shoulder, you know. Same kind of tastes same kind of pizzas or whatever, and, uh, you know, fish and chips perhaps or whatever. You know, all kinds of folk, they have all kinds of tastes, they go on holiday together and they, they are friends. They have similar tastes. That's a kind of love. And affection is a kind of love. Then there's the other kind of love which is really quite incredible, you know, where a fellow falls in love with a girl and I often describe it, I'll never forget it, in an airport one day, and I was coming down an escalator, and there was a filling girl in front of me, and they were standing gazing into each other's eyes, and I almost said, Lord, would you please unlock them by the time this thing gets to the bottom, or we're in trouble. You know, they were far away as they went down the escalator. Incredible. That's, that's eros, isn't it? That's wonderful when it hits you. Marvelous. That's Eros. But it's not Eros we're talking about. It's not friendship we're talking about. It's not affection we're talking about. It is agape love. The love of God. Which loves that which is unlovable. I love that which loves me, naturally. But God loves me when I'm totally unlovable when there is nothing in me whatsoever to appeal to him, when I'm a rebel, when I am against him. Isn't it beautiful? God loves me and sends Christ to die for me. The Father sends Christ to die for me, and Christ gladly comes at the Father's will. That is love. And I can tell you, this love of God is shed abroad in your heart so that when you meet a brother, you can't stick the sight off. You can love him. When you meet another Christian who's driving you up the walls and over the wall, 
you can still love them. So that when you meet a person who is totally obnoxious in the way they behave, you can still find love in your heart for them. Naturally, no, because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. You can afford, Christian, to be magnanimous against those who are against you. I have to learn this. I'm not very good at it. But you can afford to be. Why? Because you've got the love of God. God loved you when you were unlovable and sent Christ to die for you. Oh, lovely. The love of God, that agape love, is shed abroad in your heart. And that's what sends young people to the far ends of the earth with the gospel. That's what sends people into the slums and the sleazy pits of the world with the gospel. That's what gives the great evangel of the gospel of Jesus Christ that sends men and women across the world to those who are rebels, those who hate God, because the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts to tell them of Christ. Now, you know, <laughs> verse 9 and 10 shows us the provision of God's love. The key, of course, to this entire um, passage, you'll notice I have it at the end of that wee sort of summary on your notes. Now, that's just a little summary I'm not going through tonight, but maybe sometime you could study it when you're thinking about this passage. But there, there are five comparisons in which Paul uses the phrase much more. Notice it in verse 9, much more then. Notice it in verse 10, much more being reconciled. Notice it in verse 15. If through offense one are dead, one many be dead, much more by the grace of God. Notice it again in verse 17. Much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And in verse 20, moreover the law entered that the fence might abound and where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that little word much more is a key to the whole chapter. Much more. Now, if you have God's love exhibited to you and you have the proof of it in that Christ died for you whenever you were unlovable, and by the way, if you're not a Christian here tonight and you say, God couldn't love me, I tell you he can. You say, God couldn't have any time for me. You don't know what I am, sir. I'm telling you, my friend, when you were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Not the godly, the ungodly. And if you repent of your sin tonight and trust Jesus as your Savior, you'll be forgiven. Christ didn't die for the godly. He died for the ungodly, says the Scripture. Beautiful, isn't it? Now, notice, notice, and this is lovely, the provision that God's love brings to you. Look at the provision it brings. You have been satisfied through justification, according to verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Yeah, we have this peace. But then if you go to verse number 9, the death of Christ does even far more than satisfying you and me. The lovely thing is, according to verse 9, it satisfies God. <laughs> Much more than being now justified by his own blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justified before God. God's satisfied with the death of Christ. Why can you not be? and rest in his blood alone for forgiveness. There are a whole lot of people in Northern Ireland who don't like the preaching of the blood of Christ. But you know, if you're sticking clearly to Scripture, we've got to remember that when Christ shed his blood on the cross, he wasn't just merely shedding blood. He was pouring out his life. I had a friend of mine caught in a bomb once, and he lost seven pints of blood lying at the side of his shop. And a preaching friend of mine went past and he just picked him up and he put him on the back of a lorry that was there that had been passing. He stopped and he got him to the hospital and he'd lost seven pints of blood. His life was ebbing out. And when the Savior died on the cross, he poured out his life, justified by his blood. And I remember, I remember the great Presbyterian preacher, Glen Owen, when he was here in the city, I remember him preaching one day over there in G09 at Queens. I'll never forget it. And I remember him looking up and saying, long time ago, 
Nearly 20 years ago, I remember him saying, the greatest asbestos against the eternal wrath of the fire of God is the precious blood of Christ. It's great to have that as a cover. That poured out life. What a provision God's love brings. And if when we were enemies, have you ever seen pictures of a battle? Fellas being mobilized and going in, and as they go out over the top, or they're going through a wood or a tree, there's the enemy out there, and those guys are lying behind um, uh, buildings or behind trees or whatever. They'd nearly hide behind a blade of grass if they could get shelter from it, because the enemy's out there. And they know that the enemy wants his way. And he wants, on this side, his way. And they're prepared both to kill each other, to get their way. And that's the heart of enmity. Prepared to kill, to get my way. And that's why wanting one's own way is probably the worst sin in the Bible. To want my own way. And even I as a Christian, if I want my own way, it is a sin before God. And I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to do the other, without relating it to the Lord who bled and died and bought me at Calvary. It is a sin to want one's own way. Is that not the root of all our sins that follow? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And here's the enemy. They both want their own way. And that's what war is. That's what enmity is. Full control of my own affairs. That's what man desires more than anything else. And it is while we were in that state of enmity, wanting our own way, that Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to become friends. For he had waited a long time and waited in vain. Much more then. Being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Praise God for his lovely son. For if, when we were enemies, wanting our own way, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So it not only justifies us before God, but it reconciles us to God. How wonderful. And now we're saved by his life. And the power that resides in God is transmitted to Christ and made available by him to us. And that's why Paul cries out that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. So is it any wonder that Paul bursts into verse number 11? I wonder, could some of the stewards put the heat off? Any steward listening to me? Thank you. It's too hot. Thank you. Now we shall be saved by his life. And the power which resides in God is now coming to us, and we now know the power of Christ in our lives, that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. That's the, that's the, the provision that God's love brings to you. And now we come to the heart of the message. You can almost see Paul sitting there reeling with all this. I'm a rebel. I'm an enemy. I'm without strength. Christ dies according to plan for me. That root of the Holy Spirit sheds that through my life. The Holy Spirit that's given to me, that exhaling, exhaling power that is mine. My, he says, just a minute, everybody. And he almost, you almost see him putting the pen down. Well, what kind of a morning it was or afternoon or day it was that he wrote this. And not only so, we're not only saved by that saving life of Christ, that Christ is now within me, and that powerful life of his is within me. But not only that, we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And this is the absolute summit of the love of God. Oh, friends, what, what a passage. We rejoice in suffering. Because it makes us more like the Lord. But now here we come and we're going to joy in our glorious God. 
We joy in God. And of course, this is what the ungodly can't understand. How that a Christian thrills to the God that he knows or that she knows. He don't understand that. The world tonight passing by wouldn't know what joy we find in our God. We joy in him. <laughs> we have been brought to the very summit of the mountain of God's love. And it's almost as if Paul stands on the summit of the love of God that shed abroad in his heart and he starts to review all that he has in Christ. And he says, oh, he says, this God I have is my boast. This God I have is my boast. See, the cross of Christ is a two-way street. It brings me to God, but it brings God to me. And our boast is in Him. See, <laughs> you ever heard a fellow who falls in love and it hits him for the first time and you would think, you know, it had never happened to anybody else before? And the older folk, they smile tolerantly as he raves on about her, you know. And they're, they're tolerant to him. They're tolerant to him when he says, oh, well, you know, there's absolutely nobody like her. And of course, if she leaves him tomorrow, the usual Ulster will say, yeah, there's plenty more fish in the sea, never with cod. <laughs> but they don't say that when the fella is, is joying in this girl he has. When she's gone, there are plenty more fish. I often quote Shakespeare on that whenever he said, Mercutio said in, in Romeo and Juliet, he said to Romeo, who was in, madly in love with this girl called Rosalind, and he said, I'm going to take you somewhere and I'm going to show you a girl, he says, I'll make you think you're swan, a crow. What a horrible thing. And he did, actually. And uh, the other one was the one he fell, really fell in love with. But you know how it is in human terms? We say that there's nobody else like her. And people who have experience say, well, okay, as far as he's concerned, there's no other pair of eyes like hers. She is the one. They're not like that Presbyterian Philip Marshall who used to write poems in Ulster, you know, and he has that famous poem called Drum Lister. It is a very funny poem, and I better not quote it all. But there is one line which is very memorable. He had this girl, he had two girls actually in his life, and he didn't know which one to marry, and in the end, he married neither, or neither would marry him. And uh, it's like the fellow in Ulster went with this girl so long, and uh, after about 20 years, you know, she said, um, you don't think we should be married? And he said, well, well who would take us? Yeah, <laughs> who would take us? But you know, Marshall said on that famous occasion about that girl, probably one of the most famous lines in any Ulster poem, he said that her face was like a jail door with the bolts pulled out, <laughs> which was a very cruel expression. And yet, he didn't marry her, you see, because of her face. Well, I'm sure that there's no face, even if it looks like a jail door with the bolts pulled out, that somebody doesn't love. And you might say, ah, how could that girl love that fella? Look at him. Sure, he's like an unmade bed, the way he's dressed, or whatever. Yet she loves him. She sees something in him that nobody else does. And that's the wonder of it. That's the glory of it. And you know, if you see somebody down there in the gutter, and somebody maybe who's in real trouble, and you say, ah, there's no hope for them, and they're a dead loss, you just remember that somebody loves them. Somebody thinks the world of them. Somebody thinks there's nobody else like them. That's the way it is in human relationships. But you see, whenever we come to God and we say, there is none like unto thee, O God, we mean it. We maybe are tolerant of the fellow who loves that particular individual or the person who thinks there's nobody else like that mother. His mother is the best mother in the whole world. Yet we know that mothers are, they fail too. But whenever a Christian says that there is no one like unto their God, it is true. It cannot be refuted. There is no one like him. 
We joy in God. We exult in God. We glory in God. We make our boast in God. You think of his names. There's nobody else as a creator. There's nobody else as Jehovah. There's nobody else as the everlasting Father. There's nobody else as the Prince of Peace. No one else anywhere. The Most High God, the Possessor of Heaven and Earth, the Almighty One, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the shadow of a mighty rock in a weary land. There's no one to compare with Him. He is our God. There is no one like Him. Incomparable. Wonderful. We joy in Him. You wouldn't think it sometimes. Why do we get our minds into other things? And we get away from joying in our God. And the power goes out of our services. And the power goes out of our preaching. And the power goes out of our witness. Because it's not God-centered. Not God-centered. He is our light and our salvation, a mighty fortress, our high tower. Let me boast in God tonight. There is none like him. The ancient of days. The provider of all our needs. Our shield and our exceeding great reward. I would to everlasting days make all his glories known. We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we joy in God? You say, well, that's great. Yes, that's true. I do joy in, in, the, in the God I have. But how do I do it? Well, I'll tell you the best way to fire your heart to joy in God. Look at the record of his achievements. And that's what you have from verse 12 on down. We have received the atonement. And that, of course, is the very height of what we have, the real reconciliation. But verse 12 down to 21. Now, we could lose the argument here very quickly. It's a very difficult argument and I'm go that Paul gives that's absolutely accurate. And I'm not going to wander from it. I want to go as simply as I can. Just down this. Now, think about this. Here is the problem of sin stated. Yeah? Here is the problem of sin stated from verse 12 to verse 14. What is the record of our God's achievements? Well, we've all got a problem tonight, sin. And from verse 12 to verse 14, Paul says, our problem all began with Adam. Yeah, we come from him. The universality of sin and the universality of death all began with Adam. There's something wrong. You know, G.K. Chesterton said, Whatever else may be said of man, this one thing is clear. He is not what he is capable of being. And I don't need to tell you that, do I? Let me give you the Minnesota Crime Commission, set up by a police authority, if I remember right, in Minnesota. And this is what these guys came to as a conclusion. And this isn't a Christian document. This is an American state looking at crime. And this is the conclusion of the commission. And it sums up verse 12 to 14. Every baby starts life a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, and his playmate's toy, and his uncle's watch. Deny him what he wants, and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which could be murderous were it that he was not so helpless. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. And if permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy and given free rein to the impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, and a rapist. Hmm. Credible. Well, verse 13 and 14 doesn't just put it that way. 
But it's saying, wherefore, verse 12, as by one man sin had entered into the world and death by sin, so death is passed upon all men for all have sinned. And I'm just going to sum up these verses and not read them in detail. Verse 13 and 14 is saying that death is the punishment for breaking a command. Adam broke a command, a clear-cut command. And people died because of what he did. And he died because of what he did. And because of one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death is passed upon all men for all have sinned. And because the whole race sinned when Adam sinned, we broke the command in Adam. Even though we didn't have a command in the time between Adam and Moses, there wasn't any Ten Commandments. But people still died, even though they didn't have a literal command because of Adam. They were born with sin at work in them. And the result was that it was taking its toll, even when there were no commandments. And notice the phrase. It's a very important phrase. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam is like Jesus in a certain way. He's a figure of Jesus. Adam is a kind of picture of Christ. But what a contrast. So you have from verse 12 to verse 14, you have the problem of sin stated. But notice from verse 15 to verse 21, you have the solution. We've got an awful problem, you know. Sin has, has left a devastating trail. But my... Paul says, you want to know how to joy in God? Watch this, folks. He says, Christian church, sit up and pay attention to what your Lord has done. And it's fantastic when you think about it. The gift, that is, of course, our Lord Jesus, and the gift of righteousness that he's given to us, our right standing before God, the gift isn't like the, trans, trans, uh, the trespass. You see, the lovely thing is, the trespass is Adam's disobedient act in the Garden of Eden. But the gift, our righteousness that's been given to us through Christ, isn't like the trespass. Adam's act brought death. But Jesus' act on the cross brought life in the act of giving his life for us and pouring out his life for us. When Adam's trans trespass brought that death, Christ death brought life so the gift isn't like the trespass it's a new head in fact is Christ he's the head of the church Adam was the head of the human race what a difference there is between them Christ has brought you life in contrast to what Adam brought through his sin and trespass and I can tell you folks it's such powerful life that you can go to your Lord 10,000 times a day and get it Mmm, praise his name. I don't care what you're going through, you can go to him and get it. And Adam will bring you nothing but heartbreak, but Christ brings you nothing but life. And when you feel crushed and when you feel disappointed and inadequate, you can be renewed through Christ. One trespass, verse 16, brought death. One death brought forgiveness for thousands and millions of trespassers. What a contrast. Verse 17, Adam's transgression permitted death to reign over the whole human race. But it also meant that death reigns throughout our lives because of Adam. That's what verse 17 is saying. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, and not only death reigning, you know, and not when you're put in your coffin. No, no. You can have death even while you're alive. Loneliness. Lifelessness. A real cessation of true living. No vitality. No enrichment. No power. No fulfillment. Death reigning in your life if you don't know Christ. Death is an absence of life. But Paul says that Christ's death provides abundant grace, available again and again. And you can actually reign in life now. 
No matter what problem you have or difficulty you have, it can be overcome. And you can really live. And you can reign in life now, just like death reigns in all those who follow Adam and the Satan who deceived him. Death reigns in their lives and it's all around us. What a society. But you are a believer. You are the counterculture if you've trusted Christ. And you can reign in life now by Jesus Christ. That's the kind of God you've got. That's what he's done for you in Jesus. And in the midst of all your heartaches and pressures, you can have love, joy, peace, and gladness. Life in the midst of death. That's what he's done for you. And look how much more we have in Christ than we ever had in Adam. <laughs> what we lost in Adam, we've regained in Christ, plus a whole lot more. Adam's we pebble of sin, as it were, started to roll and brought an avalanche of sin and death. But Christ's seemingly insignificant death has brought an avalanche of grace. In verse 18 and verse 19 sums it up. So at the end of verse 19, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. See the contrast between the two. The obedience of one man, many made righteous. The disobedience of another, many made sinners. So that's why Paul says, joy in what you have in Christ. Look at what he's done for you. Look at the records of spiritual achievement. Verse 20 to verse 21, why did the Ten Commandments have to be given, somebody else say? Well, Paul's answer is, the law entered so that you might see what a big sinner you were. <laughs> you say to a little fella at home, you say, eat your food, son. And he won't. Or whatever. If you say to him, now eat your food, son, but, but don't eat those carrots. Now don't eat them. What will he eat? He'll eat the carrots. And the best way to get him to eat carrots is to tell him not to eat them. Because even little kids love to do that, don't they? Don't go into that cupboard. Just don't go in. That's the one he'll go into as soon as you're away. And it was in the beginning, so it is now. And when the Ten Commandments were given, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that's the very thing they did. And the Ten Commandments were given to prove to us that we could keep them. Paul is saying, and it's a fantastic verse, isn't it? The law entered that the offense might abound so that you might see that you were an even bigger sinner than you were. That's the whole point of the law. They were given to show us how wrong we are and to increase the trespass. And the point of all this is that Adam has ruined us, but that Christ has set us free. And Jesus is the head of our new race and the beginning of the counterculture. And Jesus is Lord so that we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ who has made for us the reconciliation. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your mighty word. We thank you, Father, for this mighty gift that's been given to us in Christ. We don't even begin to pretend that this isn't a difficult passage. Because here lying before us is the very root of the major problems of our world and the biblical answer and the biblical solution to the needs of the world. But Father, when we look at it, we joy in the Lord Jesus. And we just pray this night, Father, that you will send us from this place rejoicing in what we have in Christ. What a record of achievement. And what new life we have in him that we never had in Adam. Father, forgive us if we're miserable with, us, with it. Help us, rather, to joy in it. And the people of God said, Amen.